just getting on to strawberry powdery mildew now, which is um, if you're growing ever bearer crops, it's a sort of uh, can be a sort of six to eight month problem. So um, you know, it's um, it's quite a key in this uh, IPDM, and we've got um, a new technique that um, my colleague Robert Irvin has been working on in conjunction with AHDB. Perhaps on the next slide. So this is an um, AHDB demo farm project. It was done on a farm then in the Evesham area, and it was um, my colleague Robert Irving kept an eye on it for for AHDB. And here they um, they got a model for um, mildew control, how do you mildew control in strawberries? But um, they simplified the, um, the, the the model so you can just use the BBC weather forecast to get a figure for. Um, Humidity over the last seven days. So you add that up, and um, once you get the hum the hum uh, mildew, powdery mildew is to do with humidity. That's why it's worse in tunnels than it is outside. Outside, we tend to be thinking botrytis, inside, we tend to be thinking powdery mildew. You take the entire week of um, um, humidity reading, and this is the table that you work to. So if the temperature is under 14, then the, the mildew risk is low. So you could argue that the mildew risk is um, just starting to become apparent now. If the temperature is over 14, as these are degrees centigrade on the left, and uh, the the humidity is below 82%, then the risk is moderate. And if you're above 14, the humidity is over 82, then the risk is high. So that's um, a nice simplified risk model, and um, it, it might save you doing two or three sprays if you. Um, and I think these sort of things now, these models will come out across the board, and that they can tend to be a bit complicated. But this one, they they managed to get it um, really easy to interpret and implement on your nursery. So you've just got to have a thermometer base to begin and access to this BBC weather forecast um, app. Right, next one, please, Ewan. This is um, the, how to get it started, really. Um, you start in the spray, the year spray program early. So, um, you know, it's, it's, as we keep on saying, these things aren't good at clearing out massive infestations. So, we need to get going early, probably even before you see the symptoms. Low risk times are when the two bioprotectors, in this case, they used Sonata, which is really confusing because it's also the name of a main strawberry variety and they use AQ10. And at the low risk times, those two bioprotectants work well through the trial and they were used at um, label rates. So we're um, nothing um, different there. Next one, please, Ewan. Right, well, we should be doing this anyway now, but uh, watch the crop closely at least one week, once a week, probably do it every day if you're doing um, conductivities and that, just have a walk over, look for that up cropping on the leaves, any um, tiny speck of mildew on the leaf. Um, if you get moderate and high risk periods, then you probably have to go down to the, the, the root of a conventional chemistry. And uh, that was on, on that trial in a tunnel in, in the Evesham area. When it was at moderate to high, they did get some failure with the biopesticides. The control, a weekly program, that's weekly, remember, a weekly program of conventional mildewicides gave reliable control through the whole season. There was a serious outbreak of mildew in the trial in late June and July, which is probably the worst month for um, powdery mildew. And um, once the um, mildew um, got out of control, then the, the biopesticides were used, but they didn't give the control needed. So then um, they had to lapse back to using conventional products, which is um, a strategy that um, you have to um, rely on in the end. So um, it was all right until um, the, the serious outbreak occurred, and that would have been, you know, you've been able to sort of spot that by following the model, hopefully. And then if the model came high risk, you would go back to using something conventional. And um, if the risk was low, carry on using um, the bioprotectant. I don't know, you've done a bit of this, Nick. What's your experience of it? Uh, 
Uh, yes, I was going to ask first what variety, where, where was the trial done, what was the variety, and what were the conventional mildericides? Um, it's a good question. Um, I think they were using things like Charm and um, Luna, Luna S. Um, I think the variety was um, an Everbearer. I think it, um, I've got an idea it was Murano, but I don't know. And um, where did they do it, Chris? It was at a vicarage nurse was uh, just outside Evesham, Worcestershire. Uh -huh. Th then, they, and they, they didn't did they use um, bicarbonate at all? Again, it was um, you know it was uh, used as part of the control, but um, not not with the biopesticides. No, I think it was mainly to look at these two mildew sides compared with the conventional. Uh huh. Because as I, well, I, as I said, told you before, I think um, we, we we relied on uh, a mixture of um, of AQ10 and Serenade one week um, with with, um, with um, potassium bicarb the other alternate weeks, and and the, and this and this and the other. Um, product we used was Amino X. So we automated that with the AQ10 um, um, uh, serenade that, uh, combination. And, and, and we didn't have a problem with Moreno, but um, you have to, we, we, we made pretty sure at the beginning, at the end, I think the, 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 the secret, the, the, uh, it's very important to, to, to make sure there is no mildew on the plants when you when you buy them in, uh, and, and to make sure that you've eradicated that before you start with the biopesticides, and it, it, you, you, there is a, there is a risk with the with the with the um, with, with everbearers that you run out of of material, isn't there? At the end of the oh, season, that's the trouble. Yeah, I mean you get um, you might be spray I mean if you're spraying weekly, then um, if you if, it's, uh, it can be uh, March till November, can't it? So that's a lot of weeks. Yes, I, and I, I, we, we were quite happy. We did begin to get more mildew um, toward in the second half, September, October, um, or at the end of the summer, in effect. And uh, uh, but by that time, we 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 we'd achieved a, 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 an economic yield, and we were quite happy to to let the crop um, finish. So um, that, that that's. That's how we treated it, but uh, I, I just wish they would they would select varieties in a mildew um, in a, in an environment where mildew is prevalent. And I think east places like East Morning are, are not the best places to select mildew resistant varieties. No, I think the problem was that um, uh, East Morning were breeding for um, mildew resistance, and then they found out that all the varieties that were being used were totally. Um, susceptible to mildew and everybody was just concerned about shelf life and quality so it's but but where they where they've done where they've done experiments to, in the bit, really, and we had, yes but where they've done sort of experiments that could parallel yours there um in the past they on some occasions they they haven't found any mildew um in, in the control you know the mildew just never showed up <laughs> in that environment, yeah, no. so, so uh, you know, to select varieties in that it environment, must be a lot it must be a lot and I don't think the recommendation was that even with El Santa, you did, really yeah. yeah, so even with an El Santa, you didn't need to uh, spray for mildew post picking. Well, you know that uh, that would be a disaster here. Yeah, it would be a pain. You know, if you didn't spray El Santa post harvest, it would go completely purple in a fortnight. Yes, I mean what you don't. What is easy to overlook is that, that the, the the infection point uh, uh, phase needs humidity. Yeah. So uh, and, and then you and then you see the problem when it's when the weather's nice and and the humidity is dropped. So yeah, I was, I was hoping to get Robert on this, but he's out on farms um, this week. So I'll um, I'll find out from him whether they use bicarbonate, whether they what the variety was, and uh, get that. Get that information to you, but um, um, they're not. Uh, I don't think they're berry gardens or um, berry world, so it won't be a Driscoll variety. So it'd be interesting to see what it was. And as far as far as uh, uh, monitoring is concerned, uh, this year we bought a, a tiny tag 
which uh, monitors uh, temperature and humidity. And um, you, you can get a, a, a version which will download um, it with wireless. So it's quite easy to check on, yeah. on a week, week, weekly basis. That'd be an improvement on the um, the weather app, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah, you know, Tiny Tag is um, a small recording device that, that um, sits in the crop and records temperature and humidity. So it's a quite useful bit of kit to have, and it gives you a, a you know you can get a readout of it. And like Nick says, now you can get um, I think you get the results sent to a phone, so you can get them in real time. So they're not that dear, are they? Quite useful, right? Next one, please view it. Yeah, once they did, once they did lose um, control, it took them a, it took them a month to get back to it. So um, obviously, as Nick says, you got to start off, uh, make sure there's no mildew on the plants when they come in, and make some effort to get the mildew out early on. And um, these things aren't so bad if you're doing um, progressive 60 day, but um, again, all the varieties we're using in 60 day are very, very susceptible to mildew. So you do have to um, get the regular weekly spraying going. Um, we, I mentioned earlier on in the introduction about um, getting these things to work and everything you do in IPDM requires good coverage. So um, probably even more important than conventional pesticides, but even in conventional pesticides, you've got to have good coverage. So it's no good having curtains or runners hanging down that don't get sprayed and um, you know, ends of rows and all that. You've got, to, you've got to be spot on with it. You've got to know about your calibration. And calibration applies to your uh, introduced biologicals as well. So some people, you know, you've got a tube of um, phytocellulis red spider pests and then you've got to work out how to put them on. But it is worth pay taking a lot of effort and it'll give you a number on the um, on the canister of how many mites there are in it, and um, then you just it'll say you know we'll give you a recommendation say ten to the meter. So if there's five thousand in it, you know you know how far you've got to get with it, and you can just work that out in your mind, get the speed, and um, aim the um, the thing actually at the pest, and you know and make a note of it so you can do it again. <laughs> yeah, well that's um, a rig for spraying tabletops in tunnels. And um, because you've got that kit, you can easily um, get used to using it. Because, you know, as Nick says, we'd be used to spraying these weekly for mildew sometimes. And if you've got some kit that you can just go to, put it on the track to fill it up and it works and it gives you good coverage, then um, you're a long way through achieving successful control. If you've got to, you know, mess about with pipes and, um, you know, you're not sure what's happening, what the outputs are and all that, then, but it, the moral of the story really is you really need good kit so you can get around your mildew you spray in, in um, no time at all and then you you will you will likely do it and you will also uh, do it properly so it's worth investing in some decent kit to get the sprays on um sensing and monitoring well i think that um idea of nick's about putting a tiny tiny tag in their system downloading the information I've got to give you the mildew reading is a really is a really strong idea and I think that would be definitely improvement over the um, BBC weather app because um, you know these uh, microclimates are so local so um, you know you get um, a better idea in fact the humidity in a tunnel is likely to be a lot different to um, outdoors anyway but uh, the more accurate you can get the information you put into the model the better it's going to work Again, we, we run this theme of monitoring, really, and um, you know, you've got to be in your crops regularly, looking around at your pest diseases, conductivity, hopefully, and um, keep everything going like that. Bottom picture is one of our veg trials, but um, on each veg trial, we do put a little weather station, and uh, that weather station is uh, remote, so it's recording the weather, and um, then we can quantify any uh, weather interventions that might have affected the trial and then um, you know with herbicides it could just be dry or um, with uh, mildew it could be humidity or whatever we do use a little um, weather station in the crop 
you'd be thinking of putting your aphid bottles in. They tell us not to put them in when it's uh, cold nights. So we, you know, we're not saying at the moment, but um, usually in April we start with the um, aphid uh, predators in the bottles and the, because they're in a bottle and they fly, then um, they're obviously a lot easier to calibrate than um, if you've got to get them distributed in the plants. Because um, if you're using predatory mites, they can't walk very far, especially the uh, near cilius that we use for thrips. And uh, you need to get them more or less spot on where the pest is going to exist. But um, with the aphid predators, they can just um, fly about in the tunnels. And um, it's just a case of hanging the tube up somewhere near the crop. If there's any questions on the soft fruit, then um, if anybody wants to ask them, ask them while we're trying to sort out these issues. Or any comments? Uh, have you started doing anything yet, Alex? You got the roof on on that? Um, yeah, we've got four tunnels up and he's started with the conventional pesticides now. And hopefully the aphid spot is coming next week to um, start the aphid control. But they're, it, they're a bit behind last year. You know, the weather is cold and not very exciting so you know i think we will be a good five or six days later this year starting picking yeah i think that's quite typical it's sort of late spring now isn't it yeah you know it'll depend now on how you know that temperature do you remember two years ago the temperature in may went through the roof yeah I do. Uh, you know and in a way we're just you've got to be prepared for that so you've got to start your mildew control you know in case it gets very hot very quickly because the weather is so unreliable. You know, you just cannot judge even day to day, really, at the moment. It's very cold at nights and very hot in the days, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it is amazing with these crops, how the landscape of the crop can change in a week. If you get some, you know, you, all you need is two or three warm nights and it just, it just changes very, very rapidly. So one minute you're looking at um, breaking buds and stuff, next thing you got, you got flowers. So, um, you yeah, know, that can be um, a bit of a, a, a weight now, but um, it, always these things, even if you haven't got much aphid, they're easy to get them in because um, they're not good at clearing big infestations out. There probably are aphids there for them to uh, prey on and um, you might as well get started, you know, early on. So, um, yeah, on the EIPs, we're trying to get um, aphid bottles in this week or next. So. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any issues with the supply trade at the moment, so it's just a case of getting these things on the road. If you're doing um, veg and stuff in tunnels, the same thing really. You can get um, these bottles of uh, mixed aphid predators. They put three or four different aphid predators in one bottle, or sometimes five or six, because each um, little wasp prefers a certain type of aphid. So without going through all the entomology of what actual aphid you've got, and you might even have two or three anyway, that pays you to get a mixed bottle and um, uh, just hang it up in your tunnel or glass house and then they'll come out and they're very good at uh, hunting down the prey. Chris, could you use um, a biological on outdoor broad beans for the aphids or is that just asking too much? <laughs> um, I think it's just optimistic there, Alex. Um, the, the aphid wasps, they could well spread out of the tunnels to outdoors. And we do find, you know, they are in nature, so you do find them. So you'll find, you, you can soon see it because you'll see uh, mummified aphids on the back of the leaves, but they won't get on top of that black bean aphid that you get in broads. Mm. So um, unfortunately, that is, a, you know, that, is a, that is a difficulty. Yeah, so Chris, the, 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 this mi the mixture of aphids that you're talking of aphid predators you're talking about, um, that e each one it, it is more effective against a particular type of aphid, isn't it? Um, yeah, that's right. Would it would it be um, worth um, coming up with some uh, pictures of different aphids and 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 uh, of the different aphid species? And, and uh, indicating the most appropriate um, um, predator for, for, for that particular problem, because I think some of the some of the straight the straights are, are cheaper than the mixtures, aren't they? Yeah, you have to be careful yeah. because you, you you have to read the number of numbers on the bo in the bottle. You know, sometimes you can be caught. You know, yeah. the, the, the mixtures don't have very many in. Um, yeah, I mean, um, to be would fair, it be possible to come up with some pictures? Yeah, we can do that. We got um, a series of these IPDMs. That's a really good idea for one program. And um, on the on the next one, um, 
I've got our uh, entomologist Pete Seymour to come on, so he'll be able to give us that sort of thing. I mean, I, you know, in the field, I've had sort of pictures of aphids on uh, in books and phones and stuff, but um, they, they, you know, in the field, they are quite difficult to tell apart. But um, yes. you know, once you get an, your eye in on them, you can tell whether it's a peach potato aphid, a potato aphid, or a you know, I mean, I can tell a melon cotton aphid from a potato aphid, but it's um, pretty keen entomology that. But you know, if you're confident, um, I know that black bean aphid sort of isn't there one day and then the, the next couple of days a few plants are black over with it i don't i sort of, sort of territory for predators but um most of the ones are getting strawberries i think there's four or five that get in strawberries um they are fairly distinctive so yeah, that's right. in, in in beans and uh, we have the problem in the cherries with the black cherry aphid it's yeah it's the same one isn't it i think and and and, and the it the control of Control of of the of the cherry the aphids in the in the cherries conflicts with with um, putting mite predators predators from mites in the in the tunnel. So um, it's something we're we're looking at. Um, yes, yeah, there's, 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 where where you've got more than one major major um, pest, and it, sometimes it produces a conflict, doesn't it, with IPDM. Yeah, I think we've also had a problem with the um, fruit tree red spider in cherries as well, haven't we? With um, as well as just getting two spotted. Yeah, well, the problem we had last year was actually two spotted mite. It was not um, the fruit tree mite. I think the fruit tree one isn't very palatable to the phytosayu. This is it from uh, memory. I don't. Well, we, we, yes, we, we've been advised to use um, andersoni. Mm. Mm, it's different. Sachets. So there is usually an answer. Yeah, well, um, um, there was a few, a, a number of people interested in IPDM in vegetables, and I think like vegetables and, and ornamentals and fruit, and there's a fair bit of crossover. Um, but in um, veg, obviously, we use a lot of seed. There's a fair few options for treating seeds and modules. Most modules for brassicas now will be treated for um, cabbage root fly, so that would be a conventional pesticide we use a thing called very mark nowadays, but um, there are other options. And they tend to um, hold on to the, um, uh, the substrate in the module and give control of these things that in the field are very, very mm. difficult to control. Um, Bioprotectants are being used now, so we've got uh, trichloderma for um, controlling club root in modules. Club root's quite a difficult disease in brassicas and swedes in the picture there, so um, there might be some. There might be a route for uh, controlling these pests actually in the um, module. Uh, we're also using dipel, which is a bacteria for controlling caterpillars, and that also transfers across the fruit. And then the nematodes are quite a good option for uh, slugs. Again, you've got to be um, really specific in the control. I've seen it used big scale. And um, they were spraying it um, on warm, rainy nights and putting on in a lot of water. And they were getting great success when they actually had slugs up in the canopy where pellets were completely ineffective. So it was quite useful. Um, slug pellets in strawberries is emotive, especially if you're doing pick your own. So uh, we don't want it then pellets anywhere near where the public are and um, it's understandable really I know the, the ones we've got now are organic and they're harmless and whatever but the public don't see it as like that they see everything as um, chaos and poison and you know you've got to make sure that if you do do slug control especially if you've got two year old crops you do it very very early or you use the nematodes which don't leave any trace so um, you know these options are coming in across the board now really um, I think Everything's getting better on this um, IPDM front now. The predators are um, more, I would say, fresher, but uh, they're more, the breeding of them is better organised, the distribution of them is better organised, and the packing of them is good. So they, when you get them, you can more or less guarantee that they're going to work well. In the early days of nematodes, you often, if you put the microscope on the sachets, you could see some were alive and some were dead. Some were like a mass of wriggling eels, and the other was just completely static so I think we're getting through a lot of those problems now. Slug nematodes were once thought to work well in the lab and not in the um, 
field, so that suggests uh, a calibration and uh, an application issue to me. And I think, you know, we're getting to understand it a bit better now. So, um, these things are probably the future, you know, they're going to be, um, it's much better to uh, be able to put nematodes on just drugs and slug pellets, and slug pellets is getting to be difficult technology, really. People associate them with, you know, killing our jobs and birds and stuff, but, um, you know, we've not had those for ages, but, um, you yeah, know, there's still this mindset with them. Right, can we manage the next one? No, it's frozen, is it, now? Sorry about these technical issues, but um, it's one of these problems with Zoom and various computers around the around the planet like me and I tend to get on a sometimes get a weak signal here so sometimes I you know start to freeze and yeah um, this is a good one this is um, Coltans and um, this is a I think it's a, a competitive fungus for the Sleratinia and farmers that are interested in growing Sleratinia uh, growing sunflowers Sleratinia can be a mat it's about the only thing that sunflowers get but it does once it's in the soil, it completely wipes them out. So it's a, a, of great interest. And it's, it's a common enough disease. But uh, this contents is uh, quite remarkable at controlling it. So um, back in the day when it first came out, we had uh, a crop of um, glass house chilies. And uh, we were losing 20, 30% a year with um, Sleratinia. And we treated with contents. Never saw it again. So it was a, a remarkable control that was. Um, yeah, that was in the same soil, same crop, same glass houses, and like it was 100% control. We've never ever done that with any fungicide. So, but, you know, I'm quite mm. encouraged with some of these things that uh, it's in the green book, so it's got a proper label. It's, um, you know, it works well. So, that is a good option for um, sunflowers. We do get a lot of problems with um, Sleratinia. Yeah. A lot of these things that um, we're using now, of course, they don't have harvest intervals or. Um, any withdrawals, anything like that. So um, a lot of them cover a wide, wide spectrum of crops. So you know they, they're not like so specific as um, the pesticides are. So you know you don't need to get a massive, great store full of different products. You can just um, use the same thing for a whole range of crops. So it's not helping you much with your black aphid, Alex. But I, I think that'll have to be uh, pesticides on that one. Well, so far, we've been really lucky. We haven't had it the last few years. But, you know, when it does come, it comes with a wham, that black aphid, doesn't it? It does. It makes the right mess, yeah. Mm. You, you always get the weevil that notches the leaves, the um, pea and bean weevil. But um, I think that's largely cosmetic unless you get an absolute infestation of it. But the um, black bean aphid is horrible. Right, can we have the next one? Well, this is when we put in, um, this is mainly aimed at sort of pumpkin type, really, but um, cucurbits. But um, it's just understanding these life cycles, really, where we are. And um, this is the reason that we have to sort of spray every week when we're under a bit of pressure. And, um, you know, the life cycles are quite complicated and each stage is affected differently by pesticides. So, um, you know, that's, that's just what we're up against, really. So um, we find that, um, I always think, the best the best barometer is flowers because every day a flower opens and uh, that flower might not be protected so then you know that brings you into um sometimes you get a crop that's completely clear and mildew and the fruits so over over and i think a lot of that comes from uh, just that infected flower so you, you're saying you you had a lot of mildew late on did you um nick last time it's asking you if you had a lot of mildew later on. Um, not, not, not in the Moreno, but um, it, 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 it's really very difficult to control in this in the Centenary. July and August in the um, Marling Centenary. Yeah, <clears throat> we, we've given up. I, 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 we, after this crop, we're giving up on that one. Um, 
So you're finding that as as susceptible as um, our Santa, etc. More, um, but more so, I would say. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah, it's a pity that um, East Morning didn't sort of go off that mildew resistance because at one time they would, they used to destroy all the seedlings that weren't resistant to mildew. But um, obviously, they, if they'd have done that, they would have missed out on El Santa and Sonata and whatever. You know, the, the Dutch breeders were um, breeding on a different line altogether. But I I, I, I have been warned um, that it, it 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 comes in a, a, on the run on 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 the plants. You know, it. it, it tend to overlook that you know you think you, you get your box of of, uh, of plants in February March and you and you're delighted and you don't expect that the mildew is lurking there um, but that, that I think there's quite a lot of evidence um, from other growers that um, it's coming in with the plants and that you, you're on a hide, you're hiding for nothing really. So how do you get over that then obviously you inspect them um, at planting? Yeah, you you don't you can't see it. You, you know you can't see it. You, know, you can look look you can look very carefully and you miss it. And that, uh, um, yeah, you you just that's why that's why we 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 go in quite heavily with the uh, conventional fungicides um, very soon after planting. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and 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 do and and keep on probably four rounds of that. Um, before we stop and, and transfer to uh, the bio um, pesticides, but um, that's the best we can do. I mean, even, even the, the, it, the, the the crop that the crop that really made it was very difficult for actually what was the the follow up crop where we replanted after the spring crop. Um, the second crop was uh, much more difficult. So you're talking about like July, August, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, best of luck with anybody who wants to do it. <laughs> That's right. But, uh, I think you 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 know you you're you're on a treadmill, aren't you, with pesticide application? Yeah. So you go to, to uh, make sure the plants are clean, even though you couldn't see um, the mildew on them. You would go with four rounds of conventional pesticides to to uh, get as clean as you possibly can to start. Just assume it's there. Yes. Yeah. yeah I think that's a good rule. I think. Um, you know, buying plants is a fair risk, and I think most of the, plant, the problems that we get on farms have, a, you know, originally come in the plants. You know, we get some pretty horrible things, you know, like um, phytophthora and raspberries, etc. And you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they all came with propagation material originally. Um, mm -hmm. Quite interesting that um, you know these things, and they're endemic. And uh, one time we did have the Western flowers, it was a good example. You know, it didn't exist, and then. Then it became um, a major pest of strawberries in the 90s, and people were walking away from everbearing crops in July instead of going on to November. And um, yeah, it was absolutely epidemic, and we had no pesticides, still got none there. And then we had to um, develop use of biologicals, and uh, we got these um, near serious cucumeris mites and doubling them onto the crops, and that kept the thrips at bay, and we were back in production. But um, it forced soft fruit into IPDM, which was in some ways was a good thing. So uh, we're now confident with it, and uh, you know we're now spreading that into ornamentals and um, vegetables. Uh, veggies are a bit different, really, because then you've got big areas of monocrop, so you don't have much chance of um, introducing much in the way of wild predators. But um, the other thing about veg crops is they can be short term, so you know it's a different different area, but there are possibilities and. Um, this is where we are. Right, the uh, next one, please. Another one. Yeah, well, this is how we're using IPDM in veg, really. We're um, treating seed and modules with things. And um, there's a lot of scope, I think, for putting um, biocontrolling modules, especially because um, seed, you can wrap too much on the coat of the seed. Mm -hmm. it, all these processes tend to affect germination and seed vigor. And uh, any treated seed tends to not keep well. So, um, you know, part of um, vegetable production is to use very new, fresh seed all the time and don't keep it for a year or two, especially if it's treated. Um, it's all going to include bioprotectants, so control of um, pests is emotive in um, 
vegetables because if you grow them from any market, the tolerance of pests, caterpillars, etc., is usually zero. So it's um, a real challenge. The last couple of years, we've had like two or three million um, diamondback moths blow across the um, channel, and uh, they've infected all the brassicas. We've even seen them in strawberries and. Um, some consultants were telling people to spray for them in straws, but they they you know they, they wouldn't read in that crop, so to, to spray for them was uh, completely wrong. Nematodes I've mentioned, um, you know, we've got these options now, so um, you know it's just a case of uh, getting them into common usage. Really, I think veg is uh, a bit behind soft fruit, and soft fruit is also ahead of ornamentals, but ornamentals is coming up fast. So, yeah, good. Right, next one, please. Right, so uh, that's all for that one. So uh, if there's any discussion, anybody want any, you know, open it up a bit, any questions? Yeah, I've got a question. Last year in the tunnel, my peppers and chilies all had some kind of thrip or aphid. It, it, is it worth me putting, when I plant them, to put up this aphid bottles? I want to be as organic as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they're very effective. In, uh, these are in tunnels, are they, Ali? Yeah. Yeah, they're um, tunnel, very yeah. effective, yeah. You can get a um, mixed bag. Um, yeah, they're probably um, um, peach potato, but um, if, you haven't, if you haven't got the uh, microscope or the, the hand lens to find out, then uh, yeah, a mixed, a mixed bottle of predators put in about now, or you know, as soon as your crop is anywhere near, because they come into those crops very, very early. Yes, it um, was but where do I go? Where do I go to get it? <laughs> oh, you go to uh, well, we've been using Coppert, which is a Dutch firm, and we've been using um, BioBest. There's a whole host of them. We can give you any. We can give you information on the controls of them. Yeah, that'd be helpful. So yeah, there, 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 there's, there's a lot of um, a lot of um, suppliers about now. Even Dragonfly in Wales, who does um, he does a bit of um, Consultancy and pesticides, he's a good chap. Tell them that. We could, um, would it be useful to put a list together? I, Nick was going to say I something. I, 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 as far as suppliers, suppliers is concerned, we, we, we found Fargro is very good. And Fargro, they're, they're, yeah. they're their backup, their backup um, information, information is, is very good. And they're, they're, they're very willing to talk to you. Um, and and, and they, yeah. they, they, they do supply from from um from their own base uh, it doesn't come in uh, indirectly from an it's not imported direct to us so, so the, um, the, the, the carriage is much less than it is with some of these other suppliers right. yeah be, 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 be very careful um with some suppliers uh, you pay more on the carriage from holland than you do for the product mm. yeah, yeah. Now. yeah. yeah. So and um, uh, the other thing is you have to order it in advance. You can't ring today and expect it tomorrow quite often. You know, you have to be thinking in advance yeah. a bit. You know, there's a lead in time, unlike most things in the modern world, because yeah. they have to make it sometimes. Well, they're also living creatures, so you can't sort of put them in a store, can you? They've got to hoover them off the, off the host plants and then get them... Um, you know, on the on the substrate, and then to you. So they, you know, they, the survival rates of the um, predators once they're harvested are, are quite short. So you know, there's all the um, rumours go around that all the predators coming from one supplier are half dead when you get them. So you know, you need to be aware. But that's a, that's a useful link that to Fargo. Well, Nick, thanks for that. And the carriage being cheap because we're not going to be buying big quantities ever. So the, the carriage does impact no. on. It. No, we we we've been caught in the past. And uh, it's taught us a lesson a few, a few times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, think that, that I, I think that there were worries also about ha having uh, imports from, from Europe, uh, uh, that whether, whether there were going to be delays after uh, in, 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 in this spring. And uh, um, it's easier to deal through a supply chain that takes out that risk, I think. And, 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 yeah. and uh, uh, if for, for small amounts, uh, uh, I think they only they only need about a week, really. Um, uh, you only need to order about a week ahead. That sounds good. 
Yeah, when I was working on the tennis, uh, we were going to the tennis that didn't have any pesticide coverage, and so we had to use IPDM from the start, and it worked out better on the um, aphids than it did on than, uh, the conventional pesticides did. So once we got these things established, then we never, you know, and we used uh, aureus for thrips, because there was um, a lot of thrips on the nursery, and we put aureus on, and they, you know, put them on usually early June, and then uh, they, 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 they bred very well, and there was yeah, there was like dozens and dozens in every plant, so yeah. Aureus is a big aggressive predator that you put on sort of June time or probably a bit earlier in South Wales, and um, it's a big aggressive thing that tackles, you know, aphids and thrips. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a useful uh, strategy to control a sort of late burst. Do you, do you do much Aureus, Nick? No, not a fan. No. Well, <laughs> well I've, I've, I've seen them in uh, big crops and I've seen them in strawberries, but um, you know, the numbers that you get are absolutely astronomical. So um, I'm greatly encouraged. But the only problem is in strawberries, they do look a lot like capsids. So, you, you know, you might be thinking you've got some capsids in the crop. I think they are actually capsids. So that doesn't help. But well, we followed your advice, Chris. I mean, we we, we monitored, and if we don't if we don't see the problem, then we haven't had to make the introductions. That's why you've not had the the, the Aureus. That's the way, I, yeah. But um, you know, you, you're a lot you've got a lot more expertise than uh, some of our fellow colleagues on the call. So um, we're trying to get your expertise across to some of these new growers. And <laughs> well, the, 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 the expertise yeah. I would recommend is that the, the, you, the, you do the monitoring re regularly, regularly, and yeah. know what know what. Problems are. You do good scouting, but it's good to hear grower experiences being brought out because um, you know consultants have it, um, can tell you things, but it's best it's best long term to have somebody who's actually done it and got it working on their farm. So this is one of the reasons these webinars are so good, really, that you get a really good blend of experienced practitioners and some absolute beginners. And I think it's it's our role as training organisation to um, get over to these people that coming into the crops like maybe like Ali with the aphids that these options are much better for small growers than having a cupboard full of different pesticides yeah mm -hmm. you know you buy you buy a 50 pound bottle of pesticide and then you find a month later it's been withdrawn what do you do then so um you know they're, they're, they're not going to withdraw a, a bottle of predators and uh, you know you can have mine up in your and um, you know you get into all the monitoring procedures walking around the crop hand lens around your neck you can get some sticky traps up. You learn what the difference between a black thrip and a western flower thrip, and you know it's um, it's all good entomology. And you know, as growers and consultants, I think we are all scientists, and um, you know you need to bring that that bent in you really. So um, yeah, you know, I mean I've been working on IPDM for a long time, and I, you know I'm, I'm totally convinced of it. It's great when you go on a strawberry farm and you. You've had a bad dose of red spider, and you go and look on the leaf, and you see five predators on one leaf, and you just think, "Wow!" Yes. And you know that will clean that crop up, and there probably won't be any spider in the following year either. So it's uh, you know you never get that with a pesticide. So confidence and um, peer learning, and um, you know hopefully this program will uh, give you the confidence to use these things and get I the best see. out of it. Using there's always going to be one or two, you know, what, what you do about capsid and stuff, mm. but you know, you need to sort those those out as and when, really. Uh, Chris, can I ask you a question about the bioprotectants? They're not specific to mildew, are they? You know, if you got if you sprayed something like go back to the broad beans with AQ10, would it help with the black spot? You know, or is it yeah, specific but, to mildew? Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of these things. Uh, and they just sort of work physically against fungus. So I would expect to get some result from AQ10 and um, even maybe with bicarb, you know, I mean, yeah, bicarb, bicarb's used in some places for botrytis control. So expect them and to then, be quite wide spectrum, I would. Yeah, and then my other question is about the silica, you know, that you can um, spray on to toughen up the cuticle. Is it silica? Is that any yeah. good? And, you know, it, it's meant to keep the life of the strawberry better, sort of thing. Yeah, you've had some experience with those, haven't you, Nick? Um, well, we, we've used a product called um, Pretact for, for a very long time. And, and, and actually, it's a, it's a 
plant protein. I, I think it's actually a harpin. It's derived from Japanese knotweed or something. Uh, and it, it, you, 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 it's just a, a very fine powder. You, you have to mix it up um, about half an hour before you before you put it in the spray tank to, to let it rehydrate. And yes, I mean it does have a noticeable effect on the on the cuticle of the fruit. It, it, it makes the the cuticle makes it shiny more more shiny, but also it, also um, more elastic. So it's less likely to get damaged in picking. I, I, apart from the harbin, I, I think um, there, there are micronutrients in it as well. So uh, in that product. Do you think do you think it helps with the actual cuticle of the leaf as well from the point of view of mildew? You know, do you think it sort of makes the leaf cuticle less, you know, sort of protected from mildew? As well uh, as doing uh, the fruit. I, I, no, I I we, we I use it solely to solely to, for the fruit. To, for the fruit, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I I think it, I, um there, there there are a number of 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 elicitors, aren't there, available yeah. now that that would prepare the the the, 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 the crop um to to withstand um uh, disease pressure. And I, I off the top of my head, I think is it Botector? Is, is, yeah, is one right, and right, Romeo right, yeah, right, is another. Right. You, 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 the, the, some of them you have to apply alone. You, you, so you have to do it separately before. Uh, um, they are biological products, but they're not necessarily live products. You know. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, have, have a look. Uh, uh, well, Chris, uh, Chris should perhaps say what he thinks. Yeah, I think you're right. I think anything that's in the um, the green book. You know, has been shown to be effective, and the other thing I'll be looking for is, um, you know, proper trials and tables of results, really. But um, anything I did do, I would do, you know, in, in trials and just see if you can see a difference in it. I know it's not easy on farms, and you should be getting that information from us. But um, trials on these things are often quite difficult because they're not, you know, you don't treat the whole of the tunnel, so you can't do like we can with weed control and treat forty plots in the field. You know, you have to sort of treat the whole crop, and then. Um, it's quite difficult to intercept the results if you don't. So, um, you know, we're always a bit hesitant on recommending things that aren't proven or, or haven't got a recommendation in the green book. But it is, there's new things coming out all the time. We've just had sessions with New Farm and uh, Bayer and training sessions, Certis Europe, and um, you know, they're all coming out with these things now. So um, they're all giving us graphs and saying, this is good, this is great, this is fantastic. So we have to interpret that and implement it. And, um, you know, there'll be more and more options every year. Silicon, um, yeah, it's been used by growers for quite a long time, but, um, you know, it's always been a bit, a bit of a sort of, um, always been regarded with a bit by, with suspicion. So we, we, we expect quite a lot from the from the plants in quite a short period, don't we? Yeah. Crops like strawberries. So um, if you if you use if you use um, uh, a liquid feed um, in your spray program, that 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 can help enormously. It certainly makes the crop look better, um, and then it does take care of any sort of min minor um, nutrient deficiencies that you might have when the crop's growing very quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so maybe that uh, that that's something to do, something people should consider. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the, the healthier the crop is, the more resistance it has. Mm. You often find um, if you get stressed plants and the feed's not right, that you'll get terrible problems with. Even with pests, they seem to, for some reason they don't go for the healthy plants; they go for the poor one. Mm. If you mm. ever want to find a spider in a crop, you go to an area where the crop was poor, and you find it there for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't quite know why that is. You think they go for this sort of really good luxuriant growth, but they don't. It even mm -hmm. applies to uh, you know pretty much across the board. Aphid spider, aphid spider weevils. Even they seem to go for you know start off in bad areas. And it goes back to that old thing, you know, like it, it's no good trying to force against nature. You know, it's no good planting seed in the ground when it's not warm. You know, the the more you go with um, what the plant likes, the tougher the plant is. You know, if you try and defy nature, you always get more trouble. You know, it's, yeah. when you're doing drilling corn, you know, if you drill corn into wet, claggy ground, you're going to have endless trouble. You know, if you wait now for spring corn until the temperature is four or five degrees, then the corn is off, you know, the barley is off straight away. Do you see what I mean? And it, it just yeah. has to yeah. be 
thought about the whole way through growing things, really, doesn't it? You know, that you're growing with the conditions correct as much as you can. Yeah, I think that's right. I think um, I think it's I think farming as a word or as a verb does imply across the whole sort of scientific domain. I think you can say somebody can farm and somebody can't. It's basically being how good an observer they are and um, how they respond to what they see. Mm. And uh, I think some people have it, some people don't. But I think you can be taught it. Mm. Well, that's a great session. Thanks for that. And um, I think we're about done now, aren't we? Yeah, thanks very much. It was a yeah, lovely thanks session. Thanks, thanks, thanks for it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Th thanks okay. a lot. Good to see everyone. Good yeah. luck with the spring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys.